Now, before you're seated, right, I want you to touch yourself like that on the chest, like, you, you know, this is to me, and say, I'm loved. Amen. You can take your seats. I just feel that God wants to love us today. Is that all right? You know, sometimes we come back from conference. I had a tremendous conference. Um, four years since we've had a Mighty Men of Valor conference. And, uh, you know, we had that, that mad thing, the pandemic in, in between and, you know, other stuff that took place. Four years. But you know what, what two things that God did for me? Two things that God really, really done in my life, this, this conference. The first one was that I was able to spend it with my son. Amazing. 16-year-old son. He just went 16 in the month, just a couple of weeks before we actually went to Mighty Men of Allah. And uh, you saw him up here with his beard. He's just he's shaved his beard. Amen. He's got a little goatee now. He's doing all, his, doing all his face hair preparation, rearrangement stuff. You know, the man stuff of facial hair stuff. He's doing all that. But um, he's 16 years old. He's taller than me. He would never let me forget that or live that down. Um, but he came with me. And you have to understand that when I go to a conference, you know, I'm your pastor and uh, I love this church. Me and my wife have served here for 20 years now. Hallelujah. And, you know, you see us in a certain way. But I've been around this ministry of Victory Outreach for a long time, 28 years. And we're a big movement. We're a big movement. And I've got more friends in different countries than I've got in this country, I think. You know, some of my best friends, people I call family, are from different parts of the world. And who would have known that from a boy, as a, you know, a boy from the East End growing up in the East End of London, you know, running the streets and doing his, doing his thing, that one day I'd have friends in different nations that are tight, that we're close, we're like family, and that we've built and grown together over many, many years. And uh, it's a massive movement. When you get around these conferences, you really see what Victory Outreach is all about. You know, we have people, we have Maoris in the house we, from New Zealand. We've got islanders from Fiji and from Hawaii. And we've got, you know, uh, people from South Africa and, 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 and Indonesia and the Philippines and South America and Europe and, you know, all over the place, man. America, it's, it's crazy. And uh, it's such an amazing thing. And I was able to, to go with my son. And when I go there, I'm normally, you know, I've got stuff to do. So I'm ministering preaching in different places, and uh, I'm, on, I'm on it, I'm on all the time, it's like I'm on all the time, um, it's not like I'm just chilling, I'm on, because I have responsibility, I mean if you know, responsibility and duty is a very, very important thing, and I went out there and I was able to spend time with my son and he was able to come and experience, you know, a little bit of that, he was able to, to, to feel some of the weight of that. He was, he was able to feel the, the moving from this place to that place and this place to that place and this car journey and this plane journey and, you know, this meeting and that meeting and going here and going there. And he carried himself so well. He really, really, he was hanging with the big dogs. He was hanging with different people. And uh, I was so proud of him, man. It was amazing. And that's an answer to prayer. That's an answer to prayer. And it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing um, that took place. And also, I was able to, 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 to really understand how God works. Four years ago, we had our last Mighty Men of Valor, 2019. And I preached, I had the privilege to preach on a Thursday night at the Mighty Men of Valor in 2019. Now, you might not understand what that's about, because you haven't seen the size and the scope of these conferences. But there's four evenings in the conference, five plus thousand men, right? And four evening speakers. One was Pastor Sonny, the founder, our pastor. One was a guest that came in from a big church in America. Then there was little old me. And then there was Pastor Tim Arginzoni, who, who's a pastor up there in, in San Jose, oversees all the victory homes worldwide. And little old me representing little old you. It was an amazing thing. But check out what, what God really showed me. Is the last time I preached four years ago, I was, it was a mountaintop experience. You know, It's something that you, you want to do. 
as a preacher, you know, you want to, to, to test yourself. You want to see if God can, can use you on different levels in different platforms. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Right? It happens in all our different realms. You know, if you're a fighter, you want to fight in a championship. If you're a doctor, you want to do the top surgeries. If you're a writer, you want to write books and, 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 and put out books, whatever it is. Right? If you're a business person, you want your business to expand and grow. And I was there on top of the mountain preaching on a Thursday night to all these men, all my peers, all the people I've looked up to, all the people that I've followed. And then I did it, and then after that, I went through three years of hell, literal hell. It was horrible. The years that, pr that followed it um, was, was mad. We went through a pandemic. I mean, if you remember that, right? I mean, if you try to forget that, amen? But it was hard, man. It was tough. The church was decimated. We were nearly ruined in this nation. I mean, you know that this nation is not a Christian nation. You have to understand, the UK is not a Christian nation. It is a godless nation. And we are the countercultural people in this nation. This nation needs you and your Christianity to be good and firm and true and they need you to know Jesus in the way that he wants you to know him because otherwise there's no hope for the people of this nation. It ain't a game. But then watch this. We went through all that madness. I won't go into it. It was horrible. But then it was like God turned it full circle. And I didn't realize till I got to conference that it had been four years since we'd had the last mighty men of Allah, and I'd preached at the last mighty men of Allah, and now I'm preaching at the next mighty men of Allah, and things have come full circle. Not only did we not get destroyed, not only was I not taken out, not only was I not crushed beyond recognition, not only was the enemy not able to, to, to have his wicked way, but God fulfilled his word and his will and his ways within our lives and changed me to such a degree that when I preached this time round, it was a different person that was preaching. It was a different man, a different minister, from a different perspective. And I was able to minister a word that was not an easy word. It wasn't my favorite message. It wasn't one of them funky, cute little messages. It wasn't a happy message. It wasn't one where people are jumping up and down. But it was one that was necessary and one that God wanted me to preach because it was about bringing healing and bringing hope to people that had been through similar situations. And the thing is this, I was able to preach it because I wasn't, I wasn't wounded anymore. And even though there's a difference between your wounds and your scars, right? And I was able to preach it from a place of scars, not wounds. I'd been wounded, I'd been bleeding, I'd been opened up. The enemy had stuck me and jabbed me and hooked me and juked me. Come on, somebody. I'd been shanked by people that I loved. I'd been juked by the enemy that I hate. And all of these wounds had been bleeding, but God had taken me through the process of healing. And I was able now to have scars and be able to preach to my brethren, my brothers, my peers, about the things that they're going through, that I've been through. I mean, if you know, God takes us through hard times because he wants us to be able to go and minister to others sometimes. You have to understand that your life is not just about you. If your life is about you, you're missing out on so much. Your life goes beyond that. Eternity is bigger than, than, than you or me. And I was able to preach from a place of scars. And I, I, listen, it was tough, man. You know, it was 91 degrees in the auditorium when I was preaching. And I was literally drenched in sweat. I had sweat dribbling in places that were very disconcerting while you're trying to preach a message. <laughs> Amen? It was, <laughs> it was very uncomfortable. My son laughed. He said, one time you did this. He said, all you could see was your shirt, which was a lovely shirt, by the way, and a great shade of like a soft brown sort of color that went with my, my lovely teal blue suit. Hallelujah. But it was drenched with sweat. But, I was able to see people that I've looked up to, people that I've done, I've served with, people for years, decades, people that have preceded me at the altar being healed. Because how many of you know, we all go through this stuff. Everyone goes through stuff, right? 
How many of you have been through some hard times? How many of you felt like you failed at times? How many of you wanted to give up at times? How many of you wanted to quit at times? How many of you felt judged at times? Because people only see the things that they see, but they don't see the things they don't see. They don't know the backstory. They don't know everything you've been through. They just see you bleeding. And everyone judges. It's just human nature. It's just the world we live in. But God loves us through those times. And he does it because he loves other people that he's also wanting to reach. That it might be he's using you to reach them through the story that you've been through. Too many people cut out, they quit, they run away, they leave church, they don't do ministry anymore. They, they bury their talent, they, 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 just, they, just, they just check out. They just can't be bothered anymore, they don't want to do it. And what they're doing is they're robbing someone else of a breakthrough. Because your breakthrough is not just your breakthrough. Your breakthrough is also someone else's breakthrough. Your testimony is not just for you. It's not just to show that you overcame the test. Come on, somebody. Your mess that you went through is also a message for someone else that's going to help them negotiate what it is that they're going through. Your marriage issues, your, your health issues. Come on, somebody. Your financial issues, your, your, your internal issues. All the things that God allows you to go through, someone else is going to benefit from that. That's what gives us hope and what gives us purpose. This is eternal stuff, the struggles that we go through. And God is here, man. God is there with you. One of the things that marks eternal life is love. Love has got to be the currency of eternity. Love, the atmosphere and environment of love. God loves you and passionately desires a relationship with you. You have to understand that. He loves you more than you love him. He loves you more than you love yourself. He loves you more than anyone else has ever loved you. You've got to understand that. Although the context of our verse, and I'm very big into context when I'm preaching, is about Israel, it contains a truth statement for all of God's people. God's love is eternal. From Beginning to end, from generation to generation, God loves you. That's heavy stuff. It's the love of God that enables us to become new and be saved. You know, it's not, it's not any other thing that enables us to be saved other than the love of God. Otherwise, we'd just, we'd just stay lost and bound and broken and, 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 and stumbling. And love is the motivator for all the good works that we're rewarded for in eternity. You know, the things that we've been talking about lately in this, in this forever series, talking about eternity, talking about rewards and crowns and all the rest of it, it's not just about good works. It's not just about performance and doing good. There has to be a love motivation. It's important that we don't just think that we're just working for God in order to get some rewards later on. You've got to understand that's not what it's all about. Otherwise, you just fall into that performance trap. And the world is filled with performance. But God doesn't really care about our performance too much. Christian faith is a relationship based on love. And it's available to everyone. But not everyone receives it. Even Christians struggle with the love of God. How many of you know that? It can be difficult to receive love. How many of you have ever struggled to receive love? Some don't trust love as genuine. Some feel vulnerable receiving love when they don't feel it for themselves. I don't love myself. Why should you love me? I don't even love you. Why are you loving me? Right? It's like weird, man. What's the matter with you? You're loving me? I don't even love you. I don't even know you. You don't know me. I don't know you. Why you love me? What's the catch? Right? Sometimes many feel that receiving love makes them feel like they owe someone something. And they don't want to do that. They don't want to play that game. Some people just love the darkness more than the light. For their actions are evil. 
All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they're doing what God wants. John 3, 19 and 20. I read a book. I didn't read it. I skimmed it. How many of you know I'm a book skimmer? <laughs> Hallelujah. I pick out the good bits. Amen. It's like eating a pomegranate. Amen. Some of it's waffle. Even in my book, man, it's just some waffle in there. Some, some things I'm sure I put in there just to make up the word count. But that's all right. There's nuggets in there. Amen. Right? But there was a book that I was skimming called Human Development and Trauma by a guy called Darius Kikinavicius. That's his name, Darius Kikinavicius. <laughs> Praise the Lord for names. And it describes some challenges that can block love. The author talks about how you can't know what healthiness, respect, love and boundaries are if you haven't truly experienced them. Amen? Sometimes our upbringing doesn't bring us upright. A child, he goes on, builds their understanding about these concepts based on how their caregiver models them. So if a caregiver beats the child and labels this as loving, the child learns to associate pain with love. Woo. This association then becomes normal and expected. So you can see childhood trauma, childhood stuff, can play a big part in our adult experience of life. Openness and vulnerability, which are the prerequisites to forming healthy relationships with yourself and others, are compromised. You weren't allowed to be open or vulnerable. So instead of love, the experience of pain has now become the precondition for your interpersonal relationships. Unfortunately, those relationships in which we feel the most vulnerable are the ones that become the most painful. The author then goes on. In addition to difficult, painful, and pain-filled relationships, your relationship with yourself also suffers. You may practice, watch this, Self erasure. Self erasure. Check that out. Where you, you 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 try and rub yourself out. Hallelujah. You hate yourself. You try and get rid of yourself. You erase yourself. Amen. You might have negative self talk. How I many of you have negative self talk? Huh? Oh, come on. How many of you have ever spoke bad about yourself? Come on, somebody. I know you have. Some of you this morning woke up, looked in the mirror and went, oh my goodness, what is that? Hallelujah. Huh? Some of you stepped on the scales and now you, 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 you're like, that thing is evil. I don't believe in scales. I believe they're evil. Hallelujah. Amen. How many of you know muscle weighs more than fat? That's why I'm heavy. My muscles are bigger than my belly. Hallelujah. Huh? So therefore, with negative self-talk and all the rest of it, you find self-care and self-love incredibly difficult. If not impossible to give to yourself. He goes on, you may feel like you deserve all of this pain or accept that this is your lot in life. You may even think that you are unlovable or undeserving of love. All of these things that we, uh, we face in our lives, and let's face it, many people face this stuff as adults. You know, some of it comes, and a lot of it comes from the way that you're, up, you, you're brought up, the things that you did in your, you know, in your malleable state. I mean, if you know when you're like up to the age of five or seven, you're really malleable. This is where you learn and you grow and you develop a lot of stuff within your life. And sometimes we have these experiences that mold us and shape us and that we, we, we end up just running through and living for the rest of our lives unless God can intervene in some way and put our shape back, start to reshape us and reform us and transform us. And the Bible speaks in Romans about not being conformed to the world but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, you've got to start to think different about yourself, about others, about what your worth is. And it's difficult when you haven't had that ex experience, you haven't had that, that, that exampleship. Can someone say amen? It's really heavy stuff. And it's ultimately empowered 
by the evil beings and dark beings who oppose God. How many of you know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood? Sometimes you want to blame your parents, but your parents were probably under the, you know, the, the puppet master. Come on, somebody. There was some uncle that was under the puppet master that they were just puppets because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It ain't no point going back and, and, and beating up the person that hurt you. There ain't no point trying to go back into the past because you can't go back in the past, right? But you can change the way you think about the past. <laughs> this is a heavy thing. You can actually shift the way you think about the past. You can reform certain things, certain ways of remembering certain things or reacting to certain things. Are you with me? But you have to understand that we wrestle against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6.12. These beings are the things that oppose God and they try and mess you up because God loves you. The Apostle John, known as the Beloved, and he, he actually self-identifies, check this out, as the disciple that Jesus loved. Imagine that. Imagine intro introducing yourself to someone. Hi, my name's Paul. I'm the one Jesus loves. Huh? Why not? Why not? He was able to do that. Powerful thing. Powerful thing, knowing that you're loved and receiving that love. Powerful thing. Hi, my name. Hi, what's your name? My name's Vicky. I'm the one Jesus loves. Woo. But how is it that we identify ourselves? Are you with me? He says this. He tells us how we can overcome this. You know, this upbringing stuff, this traumatic experience stuff, this stuff that holds us captive, this stuff that takes us on paths that keep us bound, keep us down, keep us low, keep us from being able to receive everything that God wants us to receive. In one of his minor epistles, what they call the minor epistles, in 1 John, 1 John, not John 1, 1 John, chapter 4, verse 15 through 17. I'm going to read some stuff to you. Is that all right? He sets out his premise. He says, All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them and they live in God. You know, there's loads of people that identify as being a Christian. You see it on the Grammys, at the Oscars. Come on, somebody. You see all of these rappers get up. You see music people get up. Oh, I want to thank God for this award and all that. And then they're effing and blinding and cussing and grinding. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Twisting and winding and doing and all sorts of madness. Right, and they've just, you know, been singing about killing the police officer and smacking people up and doing this and doing that. Then they thank God for it, you know, for their, for their reward. But just because you say you're a Christian, don't mean to say you're a Christian. The only way you're a Christian, if Jesus lives in you. But your declaration about that is very important. Verse 16, he says, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. So to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, there is a thing around that that has to understand about the love of God. He is able to say that. What about you? He then goes on and says this, famous statement, God is love. God is love. His nature is love. Everything about him is love. But how many of you know, it's not the sappy, soppy love of this generation and this world right now where everything's acceptable. How many of you know, God's love is unconditional, but his acceptance might not be. Salvation ain't, ain't unconditional. His love is unconditional. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomever should believe in him should have salvation. Right? Right? His love is, is unconditional because he is love. Even when he, 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 even when he disciplines us in love, even when he says no to your, 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 your innermost desire, that's love. Amen? His love is his nature. He can't do anything but love. But yet, 
his love also encompasses the fact that there's no Baal worshippers in heaven. He loved Israel. Israel, I've loved you with an everlasting love, but there's no Baal worshippers in heaven because there's conditions on sacred space. And what you have to understand is much of, much of the Old Testament, much of the laws, much of the, the rituals, the sacrifices, weren't to do with morality. They were to do with purity. And it was about being able to access sacred space. That's why after Adam and Eve fell and they sinned in the garden and sin came in and death came in and negativity came in and everything started to decay and be broken. That's why God removed the tree of life from them because if they'd have eaten of it, they would have stayed in that degrading condition forever. Death would have been a part of eternity. But I mean, you know, God doesn't want death to be a part of eternity. So he placed conditions on it. Are you with me? Then he says this. He says, all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. This is heavy stuff. I'm going to break it down a little bit. In a nutshell... Our belief and our words about our belief in Jesus matter. Sometimes we don't speak out enough about what it is that we believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When you're going through it, instead of keep going, I'm going through it. Oh my God. Oh, it's so terrible. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Oh, the world's falling to pieces. Oh, I'm such a bad person. I've made a mistake. I'm messed up. Why don't you start declaring that Jesus is Lord. He's got this. Greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me. Why don't you do that? More often. Because your declaration is important. Can someone help me out and say Amen. And the reason why they matter and it's important is because these things are powerful for demolishing the thought patterns and perceptions that the Bible calls strongholds that block far too many people from re receiving God's eternal love and everything that he has for them. Are you following me? You have these thought patterns that develop over time based on trauma, based on experience, based even on education. That becomes strongholds that lock us in, that allows the enemy to come into our lives and mess us up and lie to us and keep us bound and keep us in a slave state. Keep us confused about who we are. But God wants us to know who we are, accept who we are, the way that he, was, that he created us. So when you declare or say out loud that you believe that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, you move away from your past and you start to step into your future. That's what happens. Then as you put your trust in his love, a dismantling process begins to take place within your soul. God comes in with his love and he starts to dismantle all of those things that caused you to, 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 to stay bound. All the bars and all of that stuff. Are you still with me? Is this too heavy for you? Is this too deep? I can preach something light and I can, I can pump you up if you want. Or I can preach the truth that sets you free. The more you engage with your journey of faith, the more that love grows perfect. But understand, the word for love here translates to the Greek word agapeo, agapeo. And you have to understand that's not the type of love, all-encompassing love, that people say, well, everything's love. Everything's love. If it's love, it's love. No. Because in English, our word love doesn't encompass all the definitions of love. There's at least four or five different Greek definitions of love in the New Testament. This one encompasses the love of God. It means to love, to value, to esteem, to feel or manifest generous concern for, be faithful towards, to delight in. It's a love of action. Agapeo love is a love of action. It's not just a love of feeling. It's not just a love of desire or sentiment. Or softness, sappiness. It's a love that acts for the benefit of someone else. Sometimes we want love to just benefit us. But God's love benefits other people. Are you with me? Agape love is a sacrificial love that unites and heals. It's the love of God that we see through the cross of Jesus Christ. Love in action, man. 
Someone says, how much does God love you? And then, you know, people go, that much. It's a love of choice, not of attraction or obligation. Just because you're attracted to someone, don't mean to say that you love them. Just because they're attracted to you, they might spell love L-U-S-T. Come on, somebody. Love and lust are, uh, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're two divergent paths. One is pure, the other one's perverted. Perversion is just the right thing done in the wrong way. It's not of obligation. God's not obliged to love us. Because God by his nature is love, it is unconditional. In other words, he can't do otherwise than love. So there's no conditions on his love. So how many of you know salvation is conditional? You have to believe, you have to repent, you have to be baptized, you have to be transformed, you have to be sanctified because God wants us to be able to live in sacred space. You can't live in heaven with sin and death attached to you. Are you with me? Because you can't enter sacred space. God showed us that through the tabernacle. He showed us that through the temple. And the way that there had to be cleansing, the way that there were certain rituals that had to be performed. Why? So that the person could enter sacred space without being destroyed. I mean, if you know, you can't go before a holy God in an unholy manner. You just... <laughs> it wouldn't be good for you, man. It's like trying to go to the bottom of the ocean without a, 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 a you know... A mask, an oxygen tank. It's like stepping out of a, of a spacecraft into space without a space suit. You're just gonna, how many of you have seen Guardians of the Galaxy when he does that? And he just blumps up and goes all weird and crazy because space, the vacuum of space, will start to suck your organs out of your eyes. You can't do it. So God does all these things so that we can have access to his presence. When you do that, your life becomes one of obedience to God's will, not your own desires. This is important. And the thing about love in the world today is it's all about your own desires. If it feels good, do it. If it feels good, to, and it's all subjective. You get the atheists talk about how immoral God is for killing this person and slaying Ananias and Sapphira and sending people to hell and all the rest of it. But atheists have got, ain't, ain't got a leg to stand on because they've got no, they've got no moral... Um, um, Objective. There's no objective morality. Are you with me? Everything's subjective. So you can't even say that. How do you know what's right or wrong? You've got nothing to measure it against. Just wipe your mouth. You fall. Right? But when we've got that objective morality, we want to obey it. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Because that's what love does. Love wants to, to do the right thing for the other person. Then when the text says that love is perfected, sometimes we get bent out of shape with that word perfect in Scripture, right? We want to be perfect. And you, do, you mess up. And you spoil your perfection every single day. Many of you have done that today. You've spoiled the perfection of your holiness today. Even in church, you've judged something. Right? A bad word entered your mind. Come on, somebody. You looked at someone and thought, hmm. Well, huh? the word perfect translates the Greek word teleo, teleo. And it literally means completed or fully matured. So when you give Christ your allegiance, watch this. There's a choice involved. God chooses to love you and you choose to start to love him. And as you keep investing in that relationship, it matures and it becomes complete. When me and my wife said, I do, we loved each other to a certain degree. We loved each other to make a commitment to each other in sickness and in health, which there's been a lot of that, hallelujah. Richer for poorer, there's been a lot of poorer, hallelujah. 
We're getting into the richer bit one day, my love. Amen. Right? Till death us do part, she's going to go first. <laughs> Normally I say, I'm going to go first. And she's like, no. She, she thinks we're going together. Hallelujah. I don't mind that. As long as it's, as long as it's not in a car crash or something. <laughs> Or an airplane. I don't mind laying in bed together and just holding hands and winking out of existence and breathing our last. You know what I mean? Hallelujah. But I've always told her, I'm going before you, man. She's like, no, I'm going before you. I'm like, listen, if you go before me, I want, I want your leg. Because she has a silver-coated titanium implant in her leg, man. It's worth about as much as a car. I could get a new car out of that thing. So that's the incentive. But as we started to love each other, we didn't realize the drama that we were going to go through. We didn't realize the, 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 the shedding of self that we needed to go through. But that's what matures your love. It's that God chips away everything in our lives that doesn't look like Jesus. And we start to put down some of our opinions. Come on, how many of you got a lot of opinions? How many of you know you don't have to have an opinion on everything? Sometimes you need to just shut up. Say nothing. So you don't appear stupid. Sometimes our opinions make us look stupid. You don't need an opinion on everything. Amen? Right? But it matures, it grows. And that's how it does, that's how it happens with the Lord. You start off very immature. But I don't even know, God is more concerned with your allegiance than your performance. God's not bothered about your performance that much. People, when I say that, people are like, you know, all the religious people start going, ooh. Ooh, that's a very dangerous sentiment. That's a very dangerous statement. God's not concerned with your performance. Ooh, ooh. That's inviting people to sin. No. It's just understanding that people will. But notice what, what happens. As you keep investing, you're going to grow, you're going to develop. You're going to, you're, you're going to start to, to increase in maturity. But there's a hurdle to overcome. John goes on by pointing out this in that verse 18. He talks about the love of God and he says this, he says, Such love has no fear. Because perfect love expels all fear. When we first got married, I was afraid that Vicky was going to see me as I was and she was going to reject me. A lot of people think that. It's very common. Because I was, you know, living in my own space. But then I had to move into her space. But she felt the same thing. We all feel the same thing. Amen? Because we have fear. Why? Because of those background stuff. Because what's this? It says, perfect love expels all fear. Mature, complete love expels all fear. If we are afraid, watch this. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. Woo! Come on now, remember the transactional nature of love that many people are brought up with. I'll love you if. You don't deserve my love unless... And it's transactional in its nature. And we live in a very transactional world. Right? Even, even going to the shops, you know, it's just second nature to be transactional. You want that dress? You can't just go in there and say, I love that dress. Oh, have that dress. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? Except if you're a man. Hallelujah. <laughs> you have to buy it. You have to pay something. Immature love. People that haven't been able to receive the love of God fully are afraid of what the punishment's going to be if they mess up. If they don't fulfill everyone's expectations. If they don't perform in the right manner. 
He says that if that happens, we have not fully experienced his perfect love. This is getting into the heart of why many people struggle in their faith, and it's because of fear. And more exactly, fear of punishment and torment. It's, it's speaking about punishment and torment. The word for punishment speaks about torment. They have a false belief, probably laid down in childhood or, 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 or in, their, in their nurturing experiences, that they need to perform a certain way or they'll be punished. What you get, and we find this in lots of ethnic, ethnicities, lots of old school kind of cultural beliefs, when I was growing up, definitely, the old school belief, right? That you're going to get punished if you don't perform in a certain way. But what that does, it doesn't produce obedience. It produces compliance. It produces people that are obedient to your face and then they go and do their thing behind your back. It produces people that don't learn how not to do wrong, they learn how to hide doing wrong. It produces fake people, not real people. Real love is if my son or my daughter messes up, they can come to me and say, Dad, I've messed up, and they know that I'm going to love them through it. Whereas compliant love, fake love, means that they've messed up and they're afraid I'm going to find out. Because then I'm going to be, oh, I'm going to be dismayed. I'm going to be shocked. I'm going to be disappointed. And many people live their Christianity like that. It's called transactional love. It's a twisted and perverted kind of emotional manipulation. And that's not the type of love that God has for you. Someone once said, when I spoke about this, they said, is it any different to the conditions of salvation? If God's love is unconditional, but his salvation is conditional, doesn't that, doesn't that mean we have to perform in order to be accepted? No. Very different. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 tells us how different it is because it says God loves us while we were still in the midst of our sin. He loved us even when we weren't performing well. That's the difference. The acceptance comes before any performance takes place. You're accepted in the beloved before you even understand what love's all about. God accepts you. God receives you. God creates an environment for you before you've done anything to deserve it. That's the difference. It's not transactional, it's transformational. See, when you're in that environment, then you start to change. When you receive, are able to receive love, then you start to mature and you start to develop and you start to grow. It's completely the opposite. God is more interested in our allegiance than in our performance. When Jesus called Peter and Andrew, first disciples, right? They're there fishing, doing their thing. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, he says something very important for you to understand. He says, come, follow me. And I will show you how to fish for men. I will make you fishers of men. So the first thing we have to do is we have to come and follow. Just as you are, all messed up with your limp and your one tooth. Come on, somebody. Right? With your fake look, your fake laugh, your fake smile. Come on now. With all of your hiding places, all of your madness, all of your secrets. He says, just come and follow me. And then I will then begin to show you, train you, give you the ability, empower you, grace you to go and to do everything and be everything that I created you to go and do and be. You follow Jesus first and then he shows us how to do the important things. But then John tells us something really important. Not only is our allegiance to Christ is important, so is our alliance to each other. We have to follow him, but we have to love each other. We have to work together. We have to do this together. It's not doing it on your own. You have to deprivatize your faith. A lot of people have privatized their faith from COVID onwards. They've started to say, I don't need church. I don't need to go to church. Church is a problem. Why should I give to church? Why should I give my time to church? I can't, why can't I just do it on my own? Because you can't do it on your own. Some of you know you're the problem. 
You can't save yourself because you're the one that's messed up. You can't do it on your own. Does it, well, it's me and Jesus. Stop it. That's not how it works. He created an environment for us to come into. Because how many of you know? You need other people to be able to sharpen you up. That's another Bible study. Some people don't like that. Huh? I don't care. He says this, he says, If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? Ooh. Beefs in church, clicks in church, clicks in Christianity, beefs, different things between people, different things that people hold against each other, different denominations fighting against each other over some little molehill of a, 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 of a, a secondarily important theological issue. Stop it. Get over it. If God loved you when you was messed up, how comes you can't love someone else when they're messed up? Or are you expecting everyone to be per perfect because you're still holding on to a transactional idea of love? That they can only be, be, be worth your love if they do this. Or if they fit into your mold. Or if they, if they look like you or sound like you or they're the same colour as you, from the same background as you. If they're not a drug addict, you can't trust them. If they are a drug addict, you can't trust them. Verse 21, we're closing, and he has given us this command. This ain't an option, guys. This is a command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. What does that mean? Sentiment? No, that's action. That means picking someone up if they can't get to church. That means paying for someone's food if they ain't got enough. That means encouraging someone if they're down. That means listening to someone when they want to speak. That means praying for someone even if they say, don't pray for me. People tell me sometimes, I'll say, can I pray for you? No, I don't want you to pray for me. <laughs> what am I going to do? I'm going to pray for them anyway. Because I love them. What this broken and messed up world needs and is actually searching for is not our fake performance, it's our unvarnished reality. It wants your uniqueness. It doesn't want cloned Christians. It wants unique people from different backgrounds. It wants people to speak different, talk different, have different experiences. It wants people that have broken through this and some people that are still struggling with that. It wants you to say, you know what, I don't know everything, but one thing I know is once I was a sinner, once I was lost, and now I'm found. I don't know everything. I don't know what's been happening in my life. I can't tell you everything from, gen uh, from Genesis to Revelation. I don't know all the ins and outs, but one thing I know is I was lost, broken and dead, but now I'm alive in Christ. I know that I'm loved by the God of love. I know, I know it, I know it. In a world of fakes and illusions, the very real love of God opens a doorway for people to escape to the reality of eternity. You hear people talk about escaping the matrix, right? It's nothing new, man. The Bible's always said that there's a greater reality beyond the thing that we're in now. It's called eternity. To enter it in the right way, you've got to enter it through the right door. That door is Jesus Christ and faith in Him and Him alone. There is no other salvation. There is no other saviour. There is no other method. There is no other system. There is no other name by which we can be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. No angel, no demon has, has got the offer. No false God, false religious system, false philosophical system can enable you to enter into eternity. It don't matter what mushrooms you take. It don't matter if you're smoking DMT or taking psilocybin or you're eating mushrooms and tripping out and having all these visions and madness. Spiritual trespass is all that is. 
There's only one way that you can get into the place that you're going to be safe forever, and that's through faith in Jesus Christ. That's through receiving His love. That's through knowing your love. That's through knowing that it doesn't matter what you do, it matters what He does. Everything we do either opens or closes the door. And love is the key. Start by loving Him. And then you start letting Him love you. And then you start loving yourself. Because if, if, if He thinks I'm worthy of love, maybe I am. And what does that love do? That love acts. That love starts stripping away all of the unhealthy patterns and the unhealthy habits and the unhealthy actions and thought processes and patterns. Starts rejecting and re, 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 removing and resisting all of those things. Taking them captive, the Bible says. Making them obedient to Christ. It's, it's about speaking about yourself better. It's about being more positive about your faith. It's about being more positive about your church. It's about being more positive about your brothers and sisters. Speaking it out, declaring it and acting upon it. And then what happens is not only do you get set free, but you create an environment of freedom that other people step into and all of a sudden they're like, you know what? Something's happening. What's going on? What have you got? So let's speak different and act different. Because we're loved. Holy Spirit, I pray there's people struggling with that concept in here today. I pray God, in all of this talk over these past weeks of rewards and eternity and the reality of eternity and what you want to do and what we, you want to give us. Lord, the essence of it is knowing we're loved. That we don't have to perform our way into it. It's not, we do the works because we're accepted. We work from perfection, not for it. We work from salvation, not for it. Lord, I pray today that people will grow up from how they grew up. The people will heal up from the places that have hurt them. Lord, I pray that some of the mad concepts that we have are going to shift within our lives. The feelings of unworthiness. The feelings of not being accepted. The feelings of, of we did something wrong. I'm dirty. I'm filthy. No, no, no. The love of God 